welcome to those of you who have joined. It's fantastic to see you all this afternoon or this evening, depending on where you are, or even this morning for some of you, perhaps. My name's Anna Bailey, and I'm the Scholarships Manager from the uh, John Monash Foundation, and I'm here with my colleague, Zana Greer. And Zana is our wonderful admin support officer. Um, and she's going to help with the chat and probably answer some questions as well. And we're also joined by a panel of scholars who I'll introduce um, properly later on, but we have Tom, Eve, Harry, and, 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 and. I would have Henry, but I'm not sure if he's on just yet. Yeah, yeah, but he'll be along later. So, look, thank you everyone for coming. It's fantastic to have you in this webinar. I'm going to get started and we'll move through and hopefully we'll have plenty of time for questions. So I'd like to begin with an acknowledgement of country. Uh, and as some of you probably are aware, our office of the General Sir John Monash Foundation sits, sits on Wurundjeri country. And we warmly acknowledge the traditional custodians of the unceded land on which we're gathered today at a variety of locations. We pay our respects to the traditional custodians of these many lands and elders past, present and emerging. Okay, so this is the second of our webinar series. Now, I'm expecting that some of you may have been to the first one that we uh, did a couple of weeks ago. Um, the first webinar covered the, it gave a general overview of the scholarship, um, whereas this one is more kind of focusing in on the application and the process of the application, but particularly around the preparation of the um, of your application. Um, so um, if you want to catch up on the previous uh, webinar, it was more um, spending time broadly on the scholarship. You can have a look at that on our website. Okay, and if you wouldn't mind just staying muted. Um, as we move through the slides. So I'm going to go very quickly just to recap on the last webinar for five or 10 minutes, and then we'll move into the application uh, um, process. So I want to start with a quote from General Sir John Monash, because it really underpins everything that we're on about at the foundation. And he, um, John Monash said that the privilege of education carries great responsibilities. It's given not for individual benefit alone, but to uh, benefit persons for the, befit persons for the higher duties of citizenship and for roles of leadership in all fields to make Australia great. So what he's saying there is that he believes that the purpose of education is not for individual benefit, but really for the greater good of society. And that is absolutely the foundational principle which drives our work at Sir John, um, at the John Monash Foundation. And it underpins the scholarship and the way we think about the scholarship and the way we approach the application process and selection process. So um, who is eligible for the scholarship? Well, you need to be an Australian citizen for starters, um, and you need to have completed or be about to complete a degree from an Australian university. So that means you could be about to um, finish your final semester, next semester. That's It's unusual, but it does happen, and you would be um, eligible to apply um, because the key thing is that you need to be planning to undertake postgrad um, next year. So applying this year in order to start a postgrad degree um, in 2024. So you will have already seen some of you who've been to our application portal that um, the application is for the 2024 John Monash Scholarship. Uh, a key thing is also a part of your eligibility is um, how you're able to argue um, why you've chosen the course and the institution that you have. So really, we uh, want you to be thinking about not why I want to go to this particular university, but how does that um, uh, course of study and the institution um, support my planned career trajectory and my desire to give back to Australian society? 
Um, just very quickly, what the scholarship entails. Well, it's it's very generous. It's uh, seventy five thousand dollars per year for up to three years. So if you were doing a one year masters, for example, you would get the 75,000 for the first year. If you were doing the PhD, it would be three years, three times 75. We also support uh, return, um, return flight. We don't pay the full cost, but we give you some contribution towards your return flight. Um, we also support you in other ways. We have a leadership academy which provides networking and PD, uh, lifelong networking and PD, I might add, um, for all um, scholars, all recipients of the, the award. So it's a fantastic scholarship. Okay, so what are the criteria that we use to <clears throat> select scholars? So firstly, of course, we're looking for excellence. And this um, Excellence is in terms of the degree, the outstanding results that you've obtained, but also prizes and awards. Um, it might even be if you're an artist, it might be an exhibition or it might be um, something that's sort of related to your um, academic study or your professional life that is truly outstanding. So um, I really want to say here, if you're sitting there thinking, oh, well, I'm not going to get the university medal <clears throat> because only one person does, um, therefore I shouldn't apply that don't think like that you should really be thinking about as a whole person what is that I uh, I bring to um, this um, exercise and how can I display my excellence not only with my marks which need to be good if not excellent but also in other ways we're also looking for leadership potential um, and experience and we're looking for this, this notion of citizenship is interesting and it's hard to pin down, but the questions really in the application really um, lead you to consider these things. So um, we want applicants to be um, demonstrating that they have a, have a career pathway in mind um, and that that somehow contributes to um, Australia and the benefit of Australia. Um, and of course, as I've already mentioned, we want to see a well-developed, compelling case for having chosen a university um, relevant to your <clears throat> area of study and your career uh, trajectory. Okay, so the application and selection process is um, quite detailed and um, very layered and quite complex, but um, there's a good reason for that. It's, it's actually a really, really robust uh, process, which ensures that out of several hundred applicants that we get each year, we do get absolutely uh, fantastic um, scholars who um, really do demonstrate those John Monash leadership qualities. So um, maybe 350 applications is what we start with, although this year I think we're going to be looking at quite a lot more than that. Um, from all the online applications that we receive, um, we then get a um, whole team of um, scholarly experts and professional experts to read and review those applications, the written applications, and that it, they score them against those criteria that I um, mentioned. So excellence, leadership, citizenship. Um, from that initial read and review of the applications, 100 applicants are selected for first round interviews. And these are held in each state and territory uh, from August to September. From that process, there are 40 um, out of that 100 that are then selected for the national interviews, which are in mid-October mid or thereabouts. And from that 40, we are lucky enough to then be able to award scholarships to between um, 10 and 20 outstanding candidates. So as you can see, it's a very staged process, very rigorous, and um, it, it does run very well, but it's, it's quite complex. Zana, before I move on to the application, is there anything you wanted to add? Uh, no, not at this stage. Um, I just, yeah, I guess focusing on the fact that, yes, there are a large number of um, 
applicants each year, but yeah, it is a really rigorous process. Um, we will try to communicate as early through that selections process um, to give you plenty of time to plan. Um, I do recommend checking out the important dates on our website. Um, it gives you the full map out of all of the dates that we would potentially hold interviews. So if you are um, looking to try and keep those dates free um, working forward, like if you're trying to forward plan, um, it is worthwhile keeping those in mind, uh, jumping on and having a look at those. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, yes, and look, I probably should have started. We do have the, um, the key, the closing date at the end, but it is 14th of July. So um, those of you who haven't really considered applying up until now, you've still got time. You will need to, um, it's, it's a very time consuming application, but you know, you're still three weeks out. So you do have, have a bit of time. Okay, so what does the online application look like? Um, these are the, the sections that are in the application. <clears throat> and um, it's pretty standard, really. You can see um, you know, general information, academic summary, which includes a transcript of your uh, results, um, any professional experience, relevant pref uh, professional experience, and then those key criteria, leadership, engagement, impact, and you're required to write a short piece um, on a number of um, aspects of those criteria. And so that that um, the, the um, point below that personal statements really is about that. So throughout the um, the extended the written part of the application, there's a lot of opportunity for you to demonstrate who you are. And of course, you need to provide <clears throat> three referees. And um, the way that works is you um, put their details into the system. Obviously, you you. Um, must have a conversation with them first. Um, that, yeah, that's really, really critical. It sounds obvious, but it hasn't always happened in the past. Um, and then the system, um, you send a request and, and the um, reference comes back through the system. So that's how that works. Okay, now... Tips, these are my tips. These are really, really obvious ones um, <clears throat> that I'm sure our panel, who we'll be moving to very soon, will have some um, a lot of depth to add to this. So um, first of all, keep in mind those three cri key criteria and, and think about how your um, responses um, speak to those uh, three points. Um, another ob obvious one, read the instructions. Uh, it's, it's amazing how often we see that that hasn't happened. So please do um, double check all the instructions. Get some guidance, get some um, help from um, someone, if you get them to read, read what you've written. It's really good, you know, when you've been slaving away at something like this, you get so close to it. And it's really, really helpful to get a um, second pair of eyes to look at it um, and give you some advice. Do allow plenty of time. It's it's not something that you can um, really rush at the end. Don't miss the deadline. <clears throat> Obvious, of course. Um, and yeah, be be authentic. Be be yourself because um, we're we're looking for that. We're we're looking not just at the marks. We're not just looking at your career aspirations. We are looking at the whole human being. So we really want to see um, who you are. Another obvious one, um, please draft and redraft, go back, edit, and I've got that obvious one at the bottom as well. Please proofread before you submit. Um, and, of course, choose your, really think about your referees and um, who would be the best person to write a reference for you um, in your academic and professional lives. Okay. Um, I'm going to now introduce our wonderful, wonderful scholars, which is very timely because I am losing my voice. Um, so I think here we are. Hi, guys. It is so lovely to see you. So we have Tom, we have Eve, we have Henry, and I think we have Carrie as well. Fantastic to see you. Um, and you can see um, for um, people in the audience, you can see um, the degrees and the destinations of these 
four wonderful people who I think within the next oh, month or two will be heading overseas to start their stint. So I specifically invited this um, the most recent cohort of scholars um, or asked them to be involved in this because I think the application process is really uh, fresh in their mind. Um, so before we go any far, further, Zana, looking at, I can't see the questions in the chat. Would it be a good idea to look at some of those first or what, what, how, what do you think? We've actually been quite light on questions this evening, which is in vast contrast to last session, but that's okay. We, yeah. um, I'm sure there may be plenty more towards the end. Okay, perfect. Yeah, no. I think it'd be a really great opportunity, um, firstly, just to um, introduce yourselves, um, perhaps scholars. Henry, I'll jump to you first. If yeah. you could just let um, everyone know the field that you're planning to study, where you're planning to head to, um, a brief um, intro, and then I'll jump to Carrie. Yeah, awesome. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Henry. I won scholarship last year, very fortunately. Um, my background is I'm a junior doctor based in Adelaide, and my overall aspirations are to do clinical research, especially in cutting edge areas of genetics, um, which are fast emerging to be um, very, very powerful tools for new diseases like um, dementia. Um, so with the scholarship, I'm in about three months time going to Cambridge. There's a fantastic genetics institute called the Sang Institute where I've been fortunate to be accepted for a full four-year PhD program. So I'll do that four years and then come back um, do and then combine clinical work with scientific uh, training to do some really great research. Wonderful. Thank you, Henry. Um, Chloe, I might just get you to <laughs> briefly introduce yourself as well. Sure. Hi everyone, my name's Kari. I'm a proud New Pali woman, so mm -hmm. my mob's from the Pilbara region of Western Australia, but I've grown up living mm -hmm. here in Melbourne. Um, I am senior lawyer at the First Peoples Assembly of Victoria, so we're the representative body for First Peoples in the Victorian treaty process, and that's really where my passion lies, um, and I'm going to do a Master of Laws at Harvard. And I'm really um, interested in learning about how the law can be used to empower First Nations communities. Thank you, Carrie. I may actually jump to you next, Tom. I'll get you to introduce yourself and explain where you're headed to and your interest area. Yeah, good day. My name's uh, Tom Robertson. I'm, uh, I'm from Dubbo in regional New South Wales. Um, I'm over here in Perth. I play uh, rugby professionally over here. I'm uh, taking a year off next year to go to Oxford to study a Master of Public Policy and um, yeah, my plan is uh, to go back to Dubbo eventually and um, try and help fix the uh, regional healthcare system out there. Fantastic. Thank you, Thomas. I'll jump to you next, Eve. I'll grab get you to jump off mute there. Thank you. Hi, my name is Eve. Um, I grew up in northern Tasmania. I'm now based in Hobart um, and I'm a scientist. I'm heading over to Oxford to do uh, my PhD in chemistry, looking at uh, developing catalysts for carbon dioxide um, storage and utilisation, basically. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you, Eve. Now, I'm just going to jump into the chat here and have a little look to see what questions we've had come through. Uh, firstly, we have... Would you recommend reaching out to potential research groups or supervisors to aid your application? I may actually um, leave that one with you, Anna, to answer. Um, well, yeah, I think the answer is uh, uh, yes, um, definitely. But I would be um, I would be quite selective. So I think the first thing you need to think about is, you know, what what is your story and um, and your kind of trajectory, I guess, um, and then think about where that's going to take you. So I think the question is um, around your, your proposed study. Um, so absolutely, do be, become acquainted with um, institutions and um, the, the, the sort of scholarly communities around that if you um, if, if you've kind of got a, a plan, but you want to just kind of nail it down a bit. Yeah. Do, um, would any of our panellists like to speak to that as well? Um, yeah, yeah, I'm I, 
you go through. You go, Henry. <laughs> uh, um, yes, yeah, so I was in similar. I was in that sort of position last year when I was doing my application. Um, there was a specific supervisor who I was going home, um, approaching, and then actually in my national round, it, it was a question that was asked of how far the conversation with establishing that as a potential supervisor had been had been established and whether the project was there in place. So it's definitely, definitely helpful. It also gives a lot of clarity as to what you actually want to do. If you have to say you're going to study with Joe Bloggs, if Joe Bloggs is the best in this field at this best at this institution, it makes the um, application a lot better formed, um, which I think is actually goes a long way to having a successful application. Hey, Harry, did you want to jump in? <laughs> <laughs> I'll zoom. Go on, Eve. Yeah, I think it says a lot about, um, you know, you haven't just picked the institution for the name around it, but, you know, it's because of this specific person whose interest, you know, whose research area you're really interested in. Um, and yeah, it's good. It's good. It shows like initiative that you've had a conversation with them already. Um, I wouldn't recommend emailing every academic in the department. They talk, <laughs> they will know. So just, Pick your favorite, email them, um, wait, see if they have, you know, space in their lab and then move on to the next one if they don't. Can I jump yeah. in with another question there? A bit of a technical question. Can I just, sorry, sorry, sir. <laughs> I'll just add my two bobs worth as well. So um, I guess to just to add to that, um, yes, it's really good to, to be thinking around that. And yeah, absolutely. Um, support what Henry and Eve were saying but but if you're not at that stage don't don't fret you might you might have you, you might not have a clear plan um, you might have a few ideas um, while you're putting together the written application but you still have time because there's a couple of months um, until the interview so um, yeah I just wanted to add that sorry Sana you go no that's okay um, bit of a technical question. My degree topic, geology, isn't listed on the website. Is there a way for me to sort this out? Um, I'd better jump in there, yay. <laughs> um, I, th I have a feeling, I have to double check, but um, I think there is another category when you, um, tick, when you um, choose your field of expertise. So I think that's all you need to do. If that's not the case, just choose the nearest thing but just make it really clear um what what it is that you're doing thank you Anna. and for the cv resume in the application should this focus on employment history and leave off aspects such as publications community involvement etc as this is covered in specific application written questions i might actually um jump to perhaps thomas um with your ex experience writing your application. I know it may have been some time back now, but um, what hot tips do you have for, for writing your um, CV resume for that application? Yeah, um, I guess especially for, um, you know, someone like me with a bit of a different different background, it was really important that I um, got my story together. So you don't want to sort of come in and say, oh, I want to do this degree and not have thought about the reasoning why you want to do this degree. And you have to really be able to, you have to be able to sell it because, you know, if you're, you're just supposed to be going over and studying it, you know, one of the best unis in the world and the reason why the Monash Foundation is letting you do that is so that you can bring something back to Australia. So you really have to have, you know, the reasoning why there's a greater good about what you're doing, which is, you know, pretty hard for a guy like me to be honest because I I played professional rugby. So it's not really like it's, um, it's going to be much of a good, you know, coming going over and then coming back and playing rugby. So I really had to have my story together. And I really felt it was um it was helpful. I actually had a guy that previously got a Monash scholarship um that I spoke to about how to go about it. So I thought that was really helpful. So if um you know anyone wants to read it, reach out to me individually, I'll put my email in the chat. Um uh, just to talk about how to get, you know, sort of that the story about the reason why why you want to do this and how it would be helpful. I thought that was really beneficial to me. And you know, I definitely think if I um if I went into this the uh the whole application process blind and didn't have that help, I think, uh, you know, it would have been, would have been quite tough. So yeah, if anyone wants to reach out, I'll put my email in the chat later. Um, yeah, feel free to get in touch. Thanks, Thomas. 
Um, Carrie, do you have any hot tips for CV writing and um, I guess what advice would you give in terms of conveying your employment history versus publications, community involvement, et cetera? Sure. Um, so I think the CV limit is two pages, so it is um, quite short. So the way that I approached the CV was just thinking it's just really a snapshot. Somebody can pick it up, skim it, and have an idea of sort of, you know, what you where you've worked, what you've achieved, you know, what you've done at university. Um, but really, it is just a snapshot. That's why the questions go into so much detail. I think there's a specific question about publications that you can, um, so you can put all of that there. Um, and you know, build out your leadership um, in the leadership question. Um, but I think, yet yeah, Tom, what Tom said was, you know, a really um, great sort of summary is that it is really about telling a story. Um, I imagine the people who read these are reading, you know, quite a few applications. Um, so just trying to make it interesting, engaging, um, authentic. Um, but yet, yeah, don't feel like you have to put absolutely everything into the CV. It should just really be. Sort of a high level of summary um, and there might even be things that you might leave out um, that aren't you know relevant to to your sort of goals. Wonderful thank you Carrie. And I'll jump back to you. Do you have anything to add there? Um, no look I think um, yeah I think it is just a, a, yeah everything that they've said really keep it brief um, really um, your, um, I suppose your excellence, your your qualifications, your um, your achievements will come through in your CV, but they'll also come through in your um, academic record and in your you know prizes, publications, and in your personal statements. So, yeah. Thanks, Anna. Um, could you kindly confirm if there are any issues with dual citizens applying? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, I, I shouldn't think so. Thank you, Laura, for that question. That's um, what we can do is double check, and I'll come back to you if the if that's not if if it's not possible. But it, it, if you've got Australian citizenship, then that should be fine. So, yeah, we'll see how I'll, I'll have a look at it. Thanks, Anna. What are some specific examples of things you'd like to look for to demonstrate leadership, both generally as well as leadership in the particular area you want to pursue as a career? I may actually direct that through to Eve because I haven't heard to you um, just yet. So what are some specific examples of things you'd look for to demonstrate leadership? Um, so I had a few different examples from different spheres of my life. So I think um, I was the president of a uni society. That's like a really sort of easy one um, because it's like your very traditional form of leadership, but then um, sort of complemented that with, uh, I worked as a senior resident at a college, which is kind of like more of a partial pair, but you can still go into different sides of leadership there. Um, so I guess like lead, it comes down to like what your leadership philosophy is. And I think if you're doing anything that involves other people and it's sort of your initiative, that, that's leadership. So if you're, um, you know, starting a business or a community group or leading a band, that was one of my other examples, like, you know, things like that, that, that all counts. Um, but I reckon like try and pick examples that show different sides of you um I don't know that at least that's what I would do like if I was for example the leader on 10 bands I would I would only talk about like the one because that sort of covered that point and then I'd find something different <laughs> yeah wonderful thank you Eve Henry did you have anything to add there in terms of like your approach to um, demonstrating leadership yeah I think it all comes down to this CV question of Ultimately, your, this whole application is just try and sell an image of yourself and the um, CV and your leadership is very much tailored to you and what your, who you are and what your goals are and then also what your background is. So it's very different based on different people. But for me, as a very much more scientific approach, my leadership, what I was demonstrating was through publications, through grant proposals and studies that I've led. 
whereas that's very different to Thomas, whose leadership is out on the rugby field. Um, and then there's other other people in our cohort who also have very, very different experiences. So for me, it was less relevant to talk about my previous experiences on university society um, because that just when that, that CV was two pages long, that just wasn't able to fit in there. It's also thinking about when you're putting through that CV and that resume and that leadership, it's what you want to then be able to talk about during an interview and having that those that evidence in your CV um, to back up what you're saying is also really, really important. Yeah, thank you. Can I just, I'll just jump yeah. in. Um, I think the other thing is um, we've, we have had questions from potential applicants. They've said, well, you know, I'm in third year at uni. What, what have I done? Um, and there are other people that have won the scholarship who, um, are, you know, might be in their late 20s. So they've done a lot more, you might say. Um, but the selectors are looking for leadership potential. So it doesn't mean you have to have a whole kind of bunch of things that um, you've done because, you know, you might have done, as, as Eve said, you've got that um, experience of leading a student group. You've got, you've got a couple of key things or you've got the, um, you've led a band or you've done some pastoral care. Um, don't feel overwhelmed and don't feel that um, if you've not sort of really progressed in your career um, yet, don't feel that that counts you out. Thank you. Would you recommend going to, to the same level of detail as a research proposal deep into our subject of interest when reasoning why we picked our chosen course and university? I may actually throw to Carrie on this one, um, just around how much detail you would put into your application, um, whether you'd go into a full-blown research proposal um, on your subject of interest, keeping in mind like your personal experience with your application. Thank you. Sure. I think it depends on what you're studying. So I imagine if you're um, wanting to do a PhD, what your sort of research focus will be, will be much more relevant to say if you're doing a master's by coursework, um, which is what I'm doing. Um, so I think it's really important in this question that you show that you've done your due diligence and that you're, you know, really interested in, um, you know, that university and demonstrating why. Um, so I think, you know, you'll set up sort of your goals um, in the other questions. And then it's about in this question, really showing um, why this university, why this course will help you achieve your goals. So I think I went, um, I spoke about, you know, particular subjects that I wanted to do, why um, that university, you know, why, why the professors at that university um, would assist me in, you know, developing the skills to um, then achieve my goals. Um, but I, you know, it is only 500 words, I think that question. Um, so, you, you know, aren't gonna be able to give a um, sort of really detailed research proposal but it's just sort of showing um, why that university fits your interests. Wonderful. Thank you, Carrie. I may actually jump to Henry on this one as well and get your perspective. Um, yeah, so I think I think only the question of the whole scholarship is what do you think is the biggest issue in Australia right now and from your perspective and then why are you the best person in Australia to address that issue? So if I recall back to the application process, as as a whole is very much focused on yeah what what is what what's the biggest issues and for me it was dementia from a health perspective because of the size the prevalence of its disease and the lack of treatment um, which is contrast to Eve who I think her proposal is much more around um, yeah developing green energy um, and that's because of the difference in our backgrounds but then so you want to be able to show you really thought about why this is such a big issue um, and that's they can go into researching it and then the next step is saying why is from your why is studying this specific institution the best place in the world for me to study um, this specific field and and to get the best training in order to come back to Australia so you don't really need to go into saying for me say I'm gonna right, I'm gonna run this specific study which is going to develop this new treatment for dementia that's a Bit redundant but it's 
having that insight and knowledge into why these institutions, where the scholarship is going to fund you to go to, is such a fantastic place to go to. Thank you. This next question is for E. As a fellow regional Australian, do you have any tips or advice to offer someone like me who is a regional applicant? Additionally, I'm curious to know about your experience as a regional applicant uh, during the interview stages. Being the first applicant for my institution, I currently lack mentorship, so any insights would be greatly appreciated. Thank you in advance. Sure. Okay. Um, so... <laughs> In terms of being a regional applicant for the interview stages, it was quite funny. Like I knew someone on the interview because that's a very Tassie thing. It's so small. Um, and then two of the other people on the interview panel, I knew someone that knew them. So I could, you know, ask um, what they were like. Uh, I think I was lucky in that my supervisor um, had mentored people through this process before and was super helpful. Um, I think uh, maybe someone, yeah, it'd probably be good to get in contact with someone that knows the rope. I'll also put my email down as well. But, um, yeah, I think, I don't know, this is a complicated question. I think something else is, like, I never thought I'd get it because there's, like, you know, so many people from New South Wales and Victoria, I didn't think a Tassie person would get it. So, I don't know, maybe that's can be a bit of encouragement that um yeah just because you're from a regional place doesn't mean you won't get it and I don't know like I think I was the only person who was at that interview so there, it wasn't like there was a whole bunch of us so I wasn't nervous talking to other people I'm not sure if that's helpful um I think it would be good to try and chat to someone so you possibly could get in contact with every state has a roads secretary and I know this isn't the roads but they know stuff about scholarships and they're very helpful and they were helpful to me if you've had any academics at your uni that has gone for any kind of scholarship like this that would just be helpful to chat through but also like yeah e email us ask us things um I'm happy to help I don't know if that helps um yeah, well, I'll just stop that's really <laughs> thank you, Eve. And then actually also in addition to that, add um, to either reach out to myself or Anna, and perhaps we can link you in with somebody that is from your region. Um, in addition to that, just um, you know, if you're needing to just have a few um, mentoring sessions, we we have a, a whole da database of scholars that have been through this process previously, and we'll try to link you up as best we can to someone in your region or a similar field to you. Um, that can answer some of those questions for you. Thank you, Eve. Um, I might just add there, yeah. um, a lot of universities have um, units and teams that are specially set up to kind of make sure that students know about these kinds of opportunities. And, and also a lot of them do have, um, will, will support uh, the applicants. So if, if you, um, I, what I'm thinking about at your university is, um, like the overseas study unit or something along those lines. If you could find a team like that within your university, they may well be able to help you. Um, so, yeah. Wonderful. Thank you, Anna. Uh, given that General Sir John Monash outcomes are announced before applications to foreign institutions close, does winning the General Sir John Monash Foundation scholarship help you get into, the, into your chosen course? Um, I can actually answer that one briefly. Essentially, um, once you're successful in securing a scholarship, our team will actually help write to you some uh, reference letters in support of your application. So even if you're applying to a few different institutions, we're more than happy to, um, I guess, express uh, on in written form that um, we are in support of your application for that particular institution. We will also um, let them know just how much um, financial funding that you'll be receiving from us and any conditions attached to that um, that funding. Um, Anna, did you have anything in addition to add to that? Um, look, just to say, yes, that's very much a part of what we do once um, the um, recipients, once they've been awarded the scholarships and then, you know, might be just thinking about or starting the application process to the university. And, um, yeah, we will often write a letter of recommendation. And I guess essentially, um, you know, we call it a prestigious scholarship. Um, uh, 
um, or it is known as, as one of those, you know, it's, it's a pretty high level scholarship. And so our letter of recommendate, our letters sort of speak to the quality of um, the candidates and the uh, rigorous competitive selection process. So that's the sort of thing that we will, um, you know, the, the way that we can support applications. Absolutely. Uh, do you have any examples of how humanities scholars, media theory, philosophy, cultural analysis, have demonstrated the projected impact of their research in the future? Um, well, I, I guess one of the things that I'm thinking about, I'm, well, music is something that springs to mind for, for, for me. And one of our current scholars who's actually a very gifted violinist um, but he's also interested in um, music education and I think he's in New York and he's looking at how um, community music education in schools can, can benefit society. So um, that would be one example. Um, we've, had a, uh, we've had filmmakers and I think the, the way they have drawn that out in their application is around the storytelling. Um, so we have an Indigenous woman who has made a film and it's it's about it's telling telling the stories of the, the people in in her film so it sort of depends on the field yeah it is very specific if there's somebody that you've seen um that you you're particularly interested in their work there is a potential to um connect with them. we just need to approve just check in with the scholar yeah. first before we give them yeah. their details but if you do um, have a look through our um, previous 248 scholars on our website if there's somebody that really speaks to you um, in terms of like um, inspiration in the type of work or you see like the correlation there between between um, the type of study that you'd like to do we'd be more than happy to pop you into in contact with each other um, so again reach out to myself or Anna and we'll try to link you in there yeah, and I'd just add to that. It's actually one of the application tips: is do have a look at the um, the scholars the scholars bios if you haven't already, um, because they just they give you a real sense of the, the the type of people and the type of work that that they're doing. And another really great thing to do is to listen to some of our podcasts because um, they just give you such a fantastic sort of insight into the work and, and the thinking and, and the way that um, our scholars approach things. So definitely really helpful for your application, but also really interesting. Thank you, Anna. Uh, I have a question here that's specific to a uh, person situation. So I've had a lot of disruption due to COVID affecting my ability to form close personal connections with my professors. And similarly, uh, level, um, sorry, my, yeah, similarly level academic um, during my undergraduate degree, what advice would you give about who to ask for recommendation letters for my application? I can actually speak a little bit to that because it doesn't have to be specific to um, your academic past, but your referees do need to speak to your academic capability. So it would need to be somebody that's at some stage closely observed um, your ability uh, with your study uh, and your, cap your capacity for um, that higher level of study, but it, not all three of them have to be. So perhaps pick one that you would be closest with academically that you have you know, some established relationship with, uh, and then perhaps you can have two other professional or community references. Um, Anna, did you have anything to add there? Yeah, look, it's, it's a tough one. I think the other one to think about is if, if you're finding that really just an insurmountable issue for you, then uh, you might want to think about some of the other things. There's, obviously, there's your professional life. And in, in a sense, you know, if you talk to your professional referees and, and um, explain the situation, you know, what, what they what we want to see is capacity for reflection, for learning and, and for excellence. So if you're not able to do that within um, from any of your lecturers, then that's an option for you. But the other thing I would say is if you have, are engaged in activities outside of uni and outside of work, um, you know, for example, maybe you're learning a musical instrument or something along those lines and you have a this sort of more close personal relationship kind of, you know, learning and teaching relationship with um, that 
tutor or that teacher, then that might be another option for you. Thank you. And I may throw to you and just ask um, perhaps our scholars um, their experience with the interview process and any, I guess, challenges that you you found with the interview process. Like what did you found, what did you find that really stood out to you as a, a pearly question and put a, kind of caught you out on, on um, the interview process? I'll first jump to Thomas, I think. Uh, yeah, I think we had this sort of question before about the uh, the leadership styles and the leadership questions, and you know, obviously had that um, that all settled for uh, for rugby and like sporting related leadership styles. But um, in the national panels, um, they sort of said, okay, outside of rugby, what type of a leader you are? And I sort of froze up, and I didn't really know how to answer that question because I'd sort of been preparing it, um, you know, from what my you know what my background was. So. I think it's best that, you know, especially in terms of leadership, talk, uh, think about it in terms of like broadly, like what sort of type of leadership style you have. You might not get that same question, but you might get something similar definitely in, in leadership. And it's uh, always good to have that, you know, have that ready. And also, um, you know, I think there was a question before about, you know, whether you're overseas or domestic. So I did my, like the state um, panel I did that in person and then I was on tour in Japan for the national panels so I was able to do it via zoom so yeah the the foundation was really good um in sort of letting us do it via zoom so there's no, there's no issues there Eve I'll jump to you was there any um any challenges that you sort of struggled with I guess with the interview process um either for national or for first round interviews um, I was pretty nervous on my first round interview because it was nothing like I'd ever done before, but then I knew someone, so that was nice. Um, but actually, no, I was really surprised. My national interview, every single question I got asked, I'd prepared for. But in saying that, I'm really bad on the spot. So I prepared like 200 questions. <laughs> I looked up every like hard interview question there was and just went through all of them. So um I guess if you know that you're not good on the spot, like I'm not just, yeah, just prepare as much as you can. And like mock interviews, they're so awkward, but they're really, really helpful. <laughs> but I guess uh, your strategy for keeping the nerves at bay is to over-prepare. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Any other hot tips for keeping the nerves at bay on, on those really um, challenging days? I think what I kept thinking is this is not an experience that everyone gets to do this is this is cool and to just try and enjoy it no matter what happens you know like just try and see it as like this fun fun cool thing you get to meet all these cool people you get to have like at the very least it's amazing practice for for something um and to have gotten that far like the amount of times I've heard people that are like oh well I didn't get I'm on our show. I didn't get this, but I did get something else. Um, and so I guess just going in with that mindset of just trying to enjoy it, and that that was helpful. Thank you, Eve. Henry. Did you have any thoughts for the whole um, interview process, or anything that you struggled with throughout that that um, interview for both national or um, first round? Um, I think overall the the, the big one I'd say is that. These people are actually really interested in what you're doing. Um, you're talking about, you're going in talking about things that you're really passionate about and they want to know more about it. The My state-based interview was typically more standard than what you want to do and what are your strengths, what, what's your leadership traits. Then the, the national round was, I think the biggest thing about the national round is, is actually, as he says, it's pretty extraordinary the people you're sitting in a room with. Uh, I, I was fortunate, one of the, Panelist, he was basically one of the biggest cancer researchers in Australia. Um, there's this guy who's a Supreme Court barrister, and he's also flies fighter jets as well. So it's pretty amazing what these some of the people who are interviewing you are. Um, and the, so it's, it's, it's basically a privilege. And then the other thing is, I think the more they question you, the more they're interested in what you're doing, and they want to. And so you kind of just run with it. I got a couple of curly questions. Uh, one of my most curly ones was, was saying. Someone asked me where's the leading dementia research centre in Australia, and actually that panelist was 
on the board of the leading dementia research institute in australia so she kind of just wanted to know that i knew where she was from so i think that's actually a really big point is for these interviews is you you get given the bias of the people read the bias know those bars know where they're from um because you kind of want to try and relate to what they're doing um and then yeah, the other national one i got a couple of other curly ones where i just had to make some stuff up on the fly yeah you guys all did amazingly well though i'm very very impressed through um, the whole application process i was like these it never ceases to amaze me just how talented um each of each of these people that you know come through the selection process are and for us, it's um, always very challenging to to I guess make those like final decisions because you know we do have such a talented group of people coming through each year. So it's just focusing on like your passions and letting that shine through in your your answers um, and in your knowledge of your field of study and really just honing in on 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 those aspects that really um, light you up and you know focus on 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 where you're wanting to head for your future so it's really it's really beautiful to see that shine through throughout the interview process um carrie is there any like hot tips that you have for the interview process um i think that i think i was expecting the interviews to be harder than what they were not to say that it was easy but the panel really isn't trying to catch you out they're asking questions um, that are really just aimed at drawing out your application. Um, so the first round interview I found, for, for me anyway, it was really um, sort of mirrored the questions um, that you've already answered and it was just sort of drawing um, that out a little bit more. The second one was a bit more specific about sort of your leadership styles, the leaders that you're impressed by um, and those sorts of things. Um, but... Yeah, they're they're really not trying to to trick you, um, and it was like quite a nice experience. I think it's just really hard because you go in and it's a, a twenty five minute interview or thirty minute interview, and it just goes so quickly, and you leave and you're like, I don't even know what I said, <laughs> and it's a bit of a whirlwind. Um, but I think Eve's tip of preparing is a really good one, especially if you know that you get nervous. Um, and just, you know, practicing your answers and just going in feeling really confident um, as, you know, as much as you can be when you're sitting around a board table with like nine very impressive people. Absolutely. But you're all impressive in your own right. So it's just, you know, we're at different stages sometimes in career and life. It's just um, we're just at different points throughout life. So um that's one thing I would say. But also, you know, our team will do our absolute best on the day as well as with our panellists to make you feel as comfortable as possible um, throughout that process. We'll try to make it as least daunting as, as we possibly can. Um, sometimes it, it is just that process, though, in itself that can be very overwhelming. Um, I will jump into another question here, actually. Yeah, I'm just, um, sorry, Sarna. I might just jump in. Just another comment on panels, and I'm I'm very busy assembling, setting up the the panels at the moment for for this year's selection round. And can I tell you, um, and our four panelists might not be aware of this, but they these high court judges, these leading cancer researchers, these amazing eminent Australians, you know, CEOs of large corporations, are terribly excited, and they are so positive. So I reach out and say, oh, you know, would you be available? And they just love doing it because, you know, it, it's it is really so exciting to have these, um, you know, have these people um, come into the room and talk about what they're passionate about and demonstrate a real commitment to um, to doing good things. So, um, yeah, they they're really they're good people and they 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 really love being on the panel. So, yeah, it's great. It's really good. Sorry, Zana, you go. Okay, I would also say the same for our reviewers too. They're, you know, incredibly, incredibly enthusiastic to yep. um, read through these these um, proposals that you put forward. So, um, you know, they obviously they volunteer their time and they're incredibly dedicated to ensuring that, you know, they um, thoroughly review each and every application to progress through, um, you know, obviously shortlist and progress through to the, the um, first round interviews. Um, um, sorry, Zana, I might just uh, just speak to the the um, one which we kind of touched on, the um, person who, um, Eleanor, you're um, currently 
Yeah. Well, if you're currently based overseas. So just a couple of things on that. So we do have uh, one of our panels is a um, virtual panel. Um, so that is for applicants that are based overseas. That's at the state level. And with the national panel, um, yes, it, it, it would be accommodated if you're um, overseas. Um, I mean, you know, Tom, you've already said that you Zoomed in for your um, national panel. That was just unavoidable, wasn't it, for you? You couldn't do anything about it. But, um, yeah, there are options available is what I'm saying there. Yeah, we'll absolutely work with you. <laughs> um, I may actually jump to this next question. Um, regarding the study proposal question, how in-depth should we discuss the course? Should we approach it as though the assessors have no prior knowledge about the course and we need to inform um, of the specifics or can we assume that they will be researching and examining details such as the curriculum, international opportunities and assessment methods, etc.? cetera? Um, and I may actually start with you on that question sure um yeah look i think i mean it speaks to another question we've had which is you you, you don't have many words so you can't really afford to go into a lot of detail and and if you can imagine it i mean some of you you know we have these broad fields in the application but we know that you know that when you get into postgrad study straight away you're really quite specialized and so we don't have a specialist a discipline expert that is going to match your area of expertise. But if you are broadly in the, the science, technology, engineering, then well, we will have a STEM um, person that will be reading your application. Um, but it won't be someone who um, has detailed knowledge of your um, discipline. So I would, yeah, I think you have to kind of strike that balance. You want to give enough information to... Um, tell the story about why, you know, your course of study and your institution that you're cho choosing is, is the right one, but um, not too much detailed information. I don't know if the, um, the other Tom or Eve or Henry or Kari have anything to add to that. Just really quickly, I think um, it's always good to remember that people um, who are the people who are reading this, you know, might not be subject matter experts. Um, so just to approach things in a way that is really easy to understand, because um, that will help them um, a lot. And don't presume, you know, a whole lot of knowledge. Um, it's useful to sometimes start with the basics. Absolutely. Thank you. I feel like you can say something, so like I don't really know the course you're going for, but say you're going for like, um, you know, it's renowned as the world's best masters in nutrition or something like that. You can you can sort of say the why without going into the specifics of, you know, you know, just saying like the curriculum and things like that. You possibly don't have the words for that, but you can say like why, why you want to go to that institution and and sort of you know describe it a little bit I don't know if that helps thank you I may actually jump to this next question to the panelists what was your process for figuring out how to answer the questions giving a short bio or describing your personal journey for example how did you go about working out what your story is I may actually throw to Henry how how did you go writing your short bio? Uh, is that the is that about the question that's the three hundred fifty words? That's it's, is that it, or you're talking about that question in general? It's that really short question at um, the very beginning of the application. It's kind of like a snapshot of yeah. who you are, what your strengths are, what you want the um, reviewers to know and to stand out to them. Yeah, um, yeah, because that's a really tight word limit where you try and jam pack everything into it, your future ambitions and where your past is. Um, I, I I thought basically what I want this person, because the person who's reading it, they're going to be, they get sent 20, 30, I don't know how many applications. And as they're skimming through it, what they want to know. So I, the first point was, okay, what, who am I, what's my ambition? So for me, I'm a clinician scientist and I'm passionate about genetic research and its translation to medicine. Then the next point I had, I framed it around was saying, what's my kind of track record? And then, um, and then I, I, I kind of spilled about that 150 words. And then the final bit was, okay, 
I actually framed a lot of it around my mentors um, and what they had taught me. I thought that was actually, that's something really important as well, is to talk about how, what have been the transformative experiences in your life as well, which can go more than just your CV. Because they've got those data that says that you have 50 publications and 20 presentations, et cetera, in your CV. But talk about a bit more who you are, um, what's framed you, and then where do you want to go into the future? In 350 words, which is not easy to If you think about like how you write your LinkedIn bio, for example, it's a really short snapshot that you want people to remember you by. So it's really just conveying your key message about who you are and what your focus is for your study and how you want people to remember you by. So if you think about it, you've got applicants potentially reviewing, you know, um, 10 applications each. How do you stand out in that pile of applications? How, how do you want them to remember you? I think that's probably like the key uh, in terms of delivering your message about who you are as a person and, and what you're trying to achieve professionally um, as, a, as a leader. Tom, did you have anything to add there? Uh, yeah, I, I definitely think it's uh, about talking to someone else and, and you know, about your ideas off them because, you know, sometimes in making up your story, you can, you know, I certainly I started off on the wrong path and, you know, it didn't sound really good uh, to the guy that I spoke to. So, yeah, I definitely think it's worth reaching out to one of us or someone else that you know and, um, yeah, getting getting that story together because sometimes, yeah, you get in your own little silo and you get in your own head about what your sort of story should be and, you know, how that's coming off might be perceived differently by someone else. So I think getting someone else involved in the process is definitely helpful. Thank you. Let's have a look here. I think I've got one last question. Um, my course is an international joint master's across four universities. Should I be specific as to naming each university and country in the application? I may actually go to you, Anna, on this one. Um, yeah, look, I'm a bit reluctant to say should. <laughs> um, uh, you know, it's really, there's so much to, to think about there, you know, word, word limit, et cetera, et cetera. But I think um, if you think that, uh, remember, keep in mind, it's, it's your rationale um, for the chosen degree, and in this case, four locations, which is fine. Um, so that's the overriding thing. And if you think being specific around um, mentioning all four is important to sort of build that case. Why, why are these four institutions important? Then that would be reasonable. But again, um, you know, it depends what else you want to put in that, that section. So I don't really want to be prescriptive around that. But um, yeah, it, it's really always get back to, as you know, Eve alluded to, it's the why um, of, of the choices that you make and start with that. And then um, if the four institutions are, you think, really sort of valid and important to support that reasoning, then, you know, you would you could put them in. I think um, I'm just very conscious that we're going a little bit over time and I really appreciate our, um, our panellists of scholars that have jumped on this evening and for their time because um, they volunteered their time this evening and it is um, a huge benefit to have their experiences shared with each and every one of you on the call today and for many more that um, may watch back later. Um, so I just want to say a huge thank you, firstly, and um, we are wishing you all the best for your upcoming, upcoming study because um, they will be heading overseas um, at different points throughout this year to commence their, their first year. Um, I'll just give you a chance to add in a couple of minutes um, any final words you may actually have of advice for our um, potential applicants on the call if you want to jump in and share any hot tips of, of knowledge for them. I guess maybe, yeah, talking talking with someone else is a good idea and because things can seem so obvious to you and you know your entire life story because you lived it. But then when you articulate it to someone else, they can say, oh, that's a really key point because you were doing this and now you're doing this because of this change. And it helps you solidify it. Um, and yeah, thinking like who, yeah, who are the key mentors? That's a good point. Like, do you care about, um, you know, the environment because of your mum, which is true for me, you know, like what, what, 
why are you so passionate about this thing? Um, yeah, I don't know. That's what I'll say. Well, thank you. Henry or Thomas, did you have anything else you wanted to add? Okay. Um, just there's no limits to uh, to the amount of times you can apply. So don't stress too much. If you, you know, don't make it this year, you can always try again next year. And, um, you know, don't put too much stress on making it, you know, just through this year. I know plenty of people that have, have tried, tried again and got in the second time. So, uh, yeah, don't stress about it too much. Yeah, I will second that. There, there are some applicants that have, you know, been successful on their third attempt and some have applied, you know, once their first time many, many years earlier and then reattempted, you know, six years down the line. So don't let the, the first no be an acceptance, you know, please do do um, retry later down the track if, if you didn't quite um, make it through that first time. So um, and we're more than happy to provide feedback at the conclusion of the process as well. So, um, so we can point you in the right direction for future success also. And I might throw to you to wrap up actually. Okay. Well, look, a huge thank you from me also to Tom and Eve and Henry and, of course, Carrie, who had to leave. Just so great to have you here. So fantastic to see you. But really your, your wisdom and your experience is in really invaluable. Um, thank you to Zana for doing an amazing job with facilitating the panel. And um, thank you, everyone, for coming. Do put in your applications. Reach out to us. And, um, yeah, we're there to help you and support you. So thank you, everyone. We'll hopefully see your applications. Thank you so much, everybody. You Have guys. a good evening. Yeah. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. Good luck. Yeah, good luck. <laughs>